All right, one more time. Who's excited to be in God's house? Make some noise. Amen. Amen. Today's a special Sunday. I'm so glad that you're here. It's our first annual Sons and Daughters Sunday. I'll tell you about that and what that is. It actually comes from a scripture. Acts chapter 1 verse 7 gives us this promise. It was actually a promise of a prophet named Amos that was reiterated in the New Testament here, the book of Acts, where it says, in the last days. How many believe we're living in the last days? You know what I mean? We are living in these last, biblically speaking, these last days, but God says this, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. That's available for everyone, but then he kind of singles out some people. He says, your sons and your daughters will what? They'll prophesy. Now, that doesn't mean foretelling the future. What that word means, it means to declare the will of God. That will, there'll be a, a generation, sons and daughters, that will be declarers of the will of God, proclaimers of the word and the will of God. He says, your young men, they're going to see visions. They're going to be able to see things that are not seen. And young men, or old men, he says, will dream dreams. Well, today is the first annual, the first time. Looking forward to do this every year. But today, we have four sons and daughters of this house at Discovery that are going to be bringing the word today. And they're going to be giving nine-minute devotions, one at a time. And I'm telling you, I'm so excited. They have a great word. I believe God wants to speak to you through his word today. You might want to check out and go, oh, man, this is, this is no, pastor ain't speaking or something like that. How many of you know that God's word will not return back void? If you have an open heart, God wants to speak to you today, okay? Now, a lot of these uh, young leaders, they're actually three of them are, are Discovery College students, students that we've been young leaders, and this is part of our DNA here at Discovery, we love to develop leaders and equip the next generation to change the world, okay? And so you'll be, he- you'll be hearing from some of those we've been pouring into. Three of them are Discovery College students. Uh, over these last several months, specifically, we've been teaching them about preaching and teaching and preparing the Word of God. And, uh, and so we've looked over all that. They're going to have a great word for you guys. But here's what I want you to do, because it's the first time for for all of them to preach on a Sunday stage, okay? So I remember my first time preaching, you guys, and on a Sunday stage, that is. I think I went over an hour. We actually told stories this last week of all of our pastors on how long. I think Pastor Sean has the record of preaching for two and a half hours on his first time preaching. His pastor came up to him, he said this. His pastor came up to him and says, what's your problem? <laughs> After the message. So... You ain't going to get that today. They got nine minutes, each of them. They're going to come out and stuff. But here's like, I remember my first time. And I, the first time I spoke, it was like, I look back and I think like, it was so cringe, you guys. It was so, I mean, I'm, I'm, the word of God went out and it's, it didn't, like, I know it's going to accomplish a purpose and stuff. But man, uh, they were, but I'm so thankful for the people, my pastor, my spiritual fathers and mothers around me that even as I was preaching this young kid, 21 years old, first time on a Sunday stage, and they're like amen in me and telling me, and afterwards they're coming up to me like, great job, man, you got a calling on your life. I want to be here today, I really don't, if I didn't have the affirming voice of my mentors. Like I was not, probably, I was not there yet, but they saw something in me that, that, that was not yet and called it like it was, you guys. So, so we have an opportunity today um, to, to lean in and to hear God's word. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want, you to, I want to encourage you to be like active participants in the word of God today. I want you to grab your pen, man, and lean into the word. He wants to speak to you. But if they tell a joke, laugh at it. You know what I mean? <laughs> laugh at that joke, man. And if they, if they said something good, let them know. You know, you know it's, it feels good. To, amen. Amen. Well, that was good. You know, say, go ahead and give them some of that. It'll help them out. And if the joke wasn't good, laugh anyway, okay? Just laugh, dude. And then write it down anyway if you heard it before, whatever. Like, let's lean in, though. Let's affirm the calling and the gifts that are inside of these young leaders because they are our next generation. Amen, you guys. All right, you guys, let's welcome our sons and daughters to the stage. Let's go. Right, how are we doing this morning, guys? Good? Amen, amen. I'm, my name's Yutsi. I'm one of the college students here at Discovery Church, and I'm just so honored to be able to give you the word this morning. And I just want to give a special thank you to Pastor Jason and Pastor Veronica for giving us the opportunity and always believing it in my generation. I mean, we would not be here without their leadership. So let's give it up for them, guys. And, you know, while moments like these, it could be easy maybe for me to stand up here and and give you guys the best version of myself. 
I wanted to be real with you guys this morning. I mean, can we be real, guys? And I wanted to share with you one of the biggest battles I had to fight that was preventing me from walking in my calling. You see, and maybe you're here today and you felt like I've felt before. You're sitting here and you're like, you know, I've messed up. I've messed up big time. Maybe you're here today and you're like, oh, I feel so unworthy. Like, I hear what God has for me, but I just, I just don't believe it's for me. Or maybe you're here today and there's something from your past that continues to haunt you and keep you from walking in freedom. And I pray that you would believe me when I say that the root of this, although it could be hard to identify, it's coming from a place of shame. And you see, this is why it's so important. Because if we don't confront our shame, shame will always dictate our identity. If we don't confront our shame, shame will always dictate our identity. And you see, the Bible is clear on why we shouldn't be living in shame. You see, Colossians 1.22 says, Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless, and you stand before him without a single fault. Without a single fault. And, and do you see yourself like that? Do you see yourself the way God sees you? Without a single fault? And I think a good question to ask, to like figure out maybe, am I living in shame? Am I basing my identity on this? Is this question right here. Do I live in the identity brought forth by my sin? Or do I live in the identity brought forth by Christ? And this is what the enemy wants to do. You see, he knows that if he can get you to doubt your identity, he can undermine your purpose and call. So how do we overcome this, this place of shame? You know, how do we bounce back from this? How do we start walking in freedom? And I believe this morning we're going to find out some things that shame has been robbing us from. And we're going to start leaving, living from a place of freedom. Amen? Amen? Amen. So let me give you three main ways in how we can overcome shame. You see the first one right here, write it down like this. We stop self-medicating the shame. We stop self-medicating the shame. And that can look for us in, in, in a variety of ways. You see, for me, it was, I was self-medicating my shame through people-pleasing, making sure that everyone was pleased, putting all my energy to make sure that they, they would approve of me and getting validation from them. But the root of it was, was shame. You know, I didn't want them to reject me. I didn't want them to leave me if they found out things that I wasn't sharing with them. Maybe for you, it's perfectionism. You want to control every single little thing of your life to prevent you from ever feeling shame again. Or maybe it's isolation. You found yourself maybe in a place where you've pushed all your loved ones away, all your community, because it's easier that way, or at least it seems easier. You know, I'd rather just remove myself so I don't have to deal with people ever shaming me again. And we live in, the, in these cycles of self-medicating, never treating the actual wound, and these self-medications only bring a temporary fix. And we'd rather pretend like it never happened, keeping it in, and you see Psalms 32 verse 3 to 5 tells us a little bit of what we might feel when we keep this all hidden and inside. It says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. But see, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Instead of self-medicating, we have to start inviting God into that wound because he's the only one that can bring the eternal healing into our hearts, into that shame. Let him heal you from your shame, and we, he, and we can do this by looking at the promises he set before us. You see, maybe our shame has made us feel like we, we can't catch a break, but God has promised to give you rest. Maybe your shame has made you feel like you're completely alone. Nobody's there for you, but God has promised that he would never leave you nor forsake you. Maybe your, maybe your shame has put you in a place where you feel dirty and unclean, but God has said that as far as the east is from the west, I have removed my, my, your sin from you. These are all promises that God has given you, and he who promised, he is faithful. So this is what we have to start doing. We have to start taking the promises that God has given us and start believing those so we can move from a place to shame to move to a place from freedom. Amen. Amen. So that's the first thing. We stop self-medicating. You know, we start walking in the promise that God has for us. How do we continue to walk in freedom? You know, what do we keep our eyes on? And that's the second thing we can do to overcome shame as you look at the cross. Because what you keep your eye on matters. I mean, we hear it all the time. People say, keep your eye on the prize. You know, keep your eye on the finish line. Don't look back. And that's the exact same way in how we overcome shame. You see, Hebrews 12, 2 says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. 
Now he is seated in a place of honor because of God, besides God's throne. And you see, I feel like the equation that we often filter our identity through, it's through this equation that is flawed. But I mean, we, we all fall short to it. You know, we, we believe this equation, and it's this one right here. What I did equals who I am. And so we start to believe this. What I did yesterday equals who I am. What I did five years ago equals who I am. And you see, the problem with this equation is that as long as we're focused on us, on our efforts, on what we do or what we don't do, we'll always be susceptible to shame. We'll always uh, find ourselves being vulnerable to shame because the truth is that we're not enough, you know. But how many of us know that God did something for us so that we can walk from a place of shame to freedom? And this is this equation right here. Although this equation right here doesn't work in the kingdom of God, this one does. What Jesus did equals who I am. What Jesus did for me equals who I am. And so we can start switching our focus from uh, what we did to what he did. And that's when we start walking out of shame. You see, if we truly believe what this, what this verse says, we'll believe that what he did on the cross is far greater than our biggest setback, our greatest mistakes, or our biggest failure. Because on the cross, he took on our shame, my shame, your shame, so that we might be able to receive his glory. And so we start receiving this truth, you know, we start walking in it, and we can't let it end there. We got to keep walking in freedom. And so the third way we can start overcoming shame is you embrace your identity as a child of God. And a couple of months ago, we went up to a, a young adults retreat and we were up there. And on one of the days, Pastor Jason and Pastor Veronica went up and they had us do this activity with us. And on the activity, they had us write down on our wrist different things that we identify with. You see, for me, it might be, you know, I'm a student. For you, it might be, you know, I'm a parent. You know, I'm funny. Whatever it could be for you, you know, these are things that you identify with. And the point of the, of the activity was one by one, they would have us cross one off until we were only left with one thing on our wrist. And the point was for us to see, you know, what's the number one thing you base your identity on? And I remember coming to the end of the activity and looking at my hand, what was it left on my wrist? And I mean, and rather than embracing it and, and believing it, you know, and, and rejoicing, you know, this is such a beautiful truth. I kind of I kind of brushed it off. I, I I laughed a little and disregarded what was on my wrist. And I remember saying, "Oh, this is so cliche." I didn't know it at the time, but it was my shame that was speaking. And the words that were on my wrist were "child of God." And I remember maybe I I didn't say it as as softly as I thought I did because Pastor Jason ended up catching what I had said, and he had shared something with me that day that was very profound. And I believe that some of you in this room have to hear that. Because when I was there sitting, you know, not able to accept this truth, Pastor Jason came up to me, saw what was on my hand, and he said, this right here, this is not cliche. This is who you are. This is everything, he said. And you hold on to this, because when all else fails, this is enough. And I remember, you know, going back to, to my time with God, and I mean, at first I was embarrassed a little bit. I was like, I can't believe, you know, Pastor Jason heard me say that. But there was a truth, there was a deeper truth to that. And it was time for me to start dealing with my shame because I was allowing it to dictate my identity. And so I needed a verse to hold on to, you know, to come back to when I might find myself in a place like this. And I found this verse, Ephesians 4, verse 22 to 24. And it says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. And it's corrupt through its deceit, deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And I believe that's the truth that we have to start living by. Let's pray. Father, I pray for every person in this room, every wound, and everyone who's been impacted by shame, that they would be able to see your son clearly and what you've done for them. And I pray that they would take back the identity that has been robbed by them by shame and that they would start walking in who you've called them to be, and that is a child of God. Father, I pray for breakthrough and healing, and I pray that they would not waste another minute living in their shame. God, that they would hear the words of your son saying, it's time to take your shame off and come to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. My name is Mark. I currently serve in our young adults ministry. I just want to thank Pastor Jason and Veronica for being such encouraging and amazing leaders. It's so great to be under them and serving with them. I'm excited to share this word that God has put on my heart with you guys today. The title of this message is Healing 
from bitterness. So we're going to go ahead and get started by just taking a quick step back and taking a look at what bitterness is. Bitterness is a spirit of resentment that we hold when someone has hurt us or when we feel as though someone has wronged us. It can be that chip on our shoulder, the score that we constantly keep, the grudge that we hold, or the temper that you just can't seem to control. This is a spirit that can make us sick if we're not careful because it can ruin our relationships. Everyone who's here today knows what it's like to hold bitterness towards someone because if you're in any kind of relationship, family, friend, romantic, I know that you probably know what it's like to be hurt by somebody. And so when life happens and bitterness gets dropped in your lap, do you know what to do with it? Or is this going to be something that ends up making us sick? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Paul says, Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Paul says, don't even let the sun go down while you're still angry. So before we go any further, I just want us to clarify a little bit what Paul is actually teaching here. Here's here's what he's not saying. He never said, don't let the sun go down while you're still hurt. Because that's impossible for us. He said, don't let it go down while you're still angry. So what I'm saying is that in order for us to be healed, what we need to do is we need to be able to separate the resentment that we have from the hurt that we have. Let me say it like this. When you're hurt, your soul is wounded. But when you're bitter, your soul is infected. When you're wounded, you can feel all the pain, and you can feel it so terribly, but you can receive healing still if it's addressed in a healthy way. But with an infection, you can't receive any healing until you address the disease that managed to find its way in. Okay? So if you're here tonight and you're carrying a wound that is infected and you're suffering in your sickness, can I let you know that you don't have to carry the weight of that resentment anymore? We all struggle with bitterness and resentment. And so how do we address this so that we can be free and so that we can be healed? Today I want to share with you three revelations that's going to help you become free from bitterness. Number one, We need to address both the wound and the infection because we can't really heal from our past if we only address one of these and not the other. So many times, it can be so easy for us to identify the moment or the season where somebody has hurt us, but it can be a lot harder to identify the moment where the infection began to settle in. In Mark 2, verse 17, Jesus says, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think that they're righteous, but those who know that they're sinners. How many of us like to think that we're righteous? How many of us like to think and tell ourselves that we're healthy, even though the symptoms are right there? That relationship is still broken. You're still constantly angry. You still secretly resent them for the thing that they did all those years ago because they still haven't apologized to you yet. This is the revelation that some of us need to grab hold of today. Forgiveness is not in opposition to justice. Forgiveness is not in opposition to justice. What we need to do is free our offender. We like to hold on to bitterness, and so many times this is just easy for us because we come to believe a lie of the enemy. What he wants us to think is that if we forgive somebody, that somehow means that we approve of the wrong that has been done. But forgiveness is not in opposition to justice. We want to make sure that justice is accounted for, but Jesus already accounted for it in full on the cross. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus was on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So it's not our job to keep score when Jesus is the one who has already settled the score. Okay? What we need to do is forgive our offender. Thirdly and lastly, you need to know that once you're healed, your healthy life is not meant to be lived alone. I want us to remember, Paul taught us that the enemy's strategy in all of this is to gain a foothold on us. So many times, we want to believe that we've dealt with something and that we've left it in the past that it's behind us, and so we call ourselves healed from our infection. 
but really what many of us have done. Instead of going through the healing process, what we've done is resurrected walls. We've resurrected barriers, isolating ourselves. And day after day, we let the sun set with a fortified heart, locked down to protect this infected wound that still hasn't been healed. Because if we were truly healed, we wouldn't need all those barriers. We are sons and daughters of a God who loves relationships. Our most precious possession is our relationship with God, to be his son, to be his daughter. In Psalm 27, 4, David prays, he says, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek the most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections. God doesn't... (laughs) God doesn't just call us to forgive that we would be healed and then be lost. No, he calls us to forgive that we would be free and that there would be nothing in our hearts anymore that stands between us and him. And so it's time for us to address our wounds. It's time for us to be healed from the bitterness in our souls. And it's time for us to surrender and make the choice to forgive today. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, I thank you for showing us the beauty of surrendering to you. You teach us that it's better to let go of our pain instead of holding to it tightly. When we decide to forgive, Lord, you're able to heal us. But when we decide to hold on to bitterness, we keep ourselves in suffering and unrest. Our hearts are in need of healing and our relationships are in need of freedom. I thank you for revealing your will to us today and pointing us towards forgiveness. We want to know you and we want to serve you, Jesus. We want to love you and be loved by you, our God. Holy Spirit, please soften our hearts and walk with us today as we decide to walk this out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. How are you guys feeling? It's good to see you all and receive the word today. My my name is Grace, if you didn't know, and... I'm excited to jump into the Word together. Are you guys excited? (laughs) So I'd like to talk to you guys today about an epidemic that has affected us all and still affects us today, and that's loneliness. Whether you've been hit by life's storms, like Job, in Job 7, 16, he says, I hate my life, and I don't want to go on living. I will leave me alone. Or you just don't find the meaning and purpose of it all, like Solomon in Ecclesiastes, where he says, everything is meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Loneliness is a problem we all share. And even today, we find that 58% of Americans have reported feeling lonely consistently. And 47% have reported that their relationships with others aren't even meaningful. These aren't random statistics. This means that half of the U.S. population is affected by loneliness. The the feeling is so familiar for so many of us. The loneliness, the depression, the self-isolation has been an increasing, increasing issue in our society today for so long. And 2020 and COVID pandemic have only exasperated us. And it's not just for students. It's for everyone at every life stage, and they're choosing isolation and loneliness because it's easier. Because loneliness is something you feel. It's, it's something really real to us. However, it wasn't merely the absence of people around us. Some of us could attest to even being in a classroom or a workspace or a crowded worship center like this where we can feel physically close to people but still experience the sense that nobody truly knows us or understands who we are. Because loneliness isn't the lack of a crowd, it's a lack of connecting. And God sees our, our need for connection and wants us to be connected to people because God's design for community counters isolation. Jesus is an amazing example of living in community because he was God. He still is God, and when he was here on earth, he could have did it all on his own. He could have ran his ministry, but he chose his disciples to do ministry with him. He chose that. Why? 
Because there's a difference, though, that we need to point out because Jesus is seen going into solitude and solitary places. There's a difference between isolation and solitude. Isolation is running from something, but solitude is running towards God. Jesus was not exempt from feeling the turmoil of life. And like many of us, when we hit hard times, we can either isolate ourselves and push people away, or we can go into God's presence in solitude and get closer to him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus tells his disciples that he feels so overwhelmed that he needs his closest friends, Peter, James, and John, to come with him to pray. And in Luke 22, 45 to 46, it says, When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. It says he rose from prayer. He came out of God's presence to get his friend's support because he needed it. And even if they failed him in that moment, Jesus was showing us an importance of having people close to us when we're in need. When we feel so overwhelmed with the demands and the pressures of life, we're going to need some friends, some close people to strengthen us. Because the reality is, when you say you don't need people, you're saying you don't need Jesus. In Matthew 25, it says, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whoever, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. The way you treat the people around you mirrors your relationship with Christ. Whatever you do for others, you do for him. And the reality is, God will speak to the people around you. He knows that you need people. He knows you need correction. Like a, a Jethro to Moses, Jethro corrected Moses' leadership in his life. You're going to need direction from those around you. Like Ruth and Naomi, Naomi directed Ruth to Boaz because she wanted her to have a family. You don't only need correction and direction, but you're going to need affirmation from those close to you. Like when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, she was feeling so isolated and alone, but Elizabeth came to her and confirmed what the angel had prophesied over her life, bringing her comfort. God will use those around you to bring you correction, direction, and affirmation of God's will into your life. God employs those in our midst to guide, correct, and affirm his will within our lives. But remember, when loneliness wraps around you, your feelings can distort reality. And the reality is you aren't alone. So when you're feeling alone, your feelings are lying to you. In Deuteronomy 31, 6 to 8, it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. If you believe you're alone, it becomes a reality in your feelings. Do not believe the lie of the enemy that you are alone. God's comforting presence is very real to us, and it is accessible right here, right now, anywhere and everywhere that you go. Choices lead, and your feelings follow. And what I mean by that is we're going to have to make four really important choices to overcome our loneliness. The first choice is choose to run to God. Instead of running away from your problems, run towards God and healthy solitude. Instead of running to binge eating, to the wrong relationships, to addiction, to porn, to all these things that won't give you what God knows you need, choose to run to God. Number two, choose to connect with people. Instead of turning away from friendships and letting your hurt and your fear taint your views on community, run to a healthy, godly community. Because the reality is you aren't alone and you're very much surrounded by people here at Discovery who want to do life with you. Since choices lead and feelings follow, we're going to make different choices. We're going to choose to run to God. We're going to choose to connect with people. And we're also going to choose to be known. 
It's your choice to open up. And it's your choice to stay silent. But you're not going to make any deep roots. You're not going to make any deep friendships or relationships if you stay silent. Choose to be known by people and know others who are probably in the same boat as you. And the fourth important choice to overcome loneliness is to choose to belong. Instead of pushing people away and again isolating yourself from the community that surrounds you, choose to belong somewhere. Choose to go to track one and belong to a church family. Choose to go to track two and belong to a team. Choose to go and belong to a small group. Choose to even belong to a group of friends that just comes to church together. Because you're going to need the people around you to correct, direct, and affirm you. So let's make that choice together today as we bow our heads in prayer. Today, God, we are not going to choose to believe the lie that we're alone. We're going to choose to run to you, God. We choose to run to community. Help us choose to be known and belong, Lord. Help us recognize your presence working in our life as we make the choice to not only go deeper in our relationship with you, God, but to go deeper and build healthy relationships with those around us. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen and amen. Good afternoon, Discovery Church. Aren't you guys excited to be in God's house today? Amen, man. I would like to personally thank both Pastor Jason and Pastor Veronica just for this opportunity to be speaking here today. It is such a blessing. If you guys do not know me, my name is Stephen Bernal. I am a Discovery College student, and it has been such a life-changing and blessing opportunity to be a part of a program that's just surrounded with great leaders and great mentors. Now, I would like to open up with a statistic that was very heavy on my heart. As I was praying, I was fasting and getting ready for today. This is just something that weighed heavy on me. You see, in a 2022 case study done by the National Council of Mental Well-Being, it is estimated that 70% of adults in the United States have experienced some type of traumatic event at least once in their lives. 70% of adults. That actually equates out to 223.4 million adults. Now, I know as soon as I say the word trauma, I can feel some of you guys shifting in your seats. I could understand that some of you guys might be uncomfortable. Some of you guys might get a little jittery. Some of you guys might even be building up some walls right now. Some thoughts you guys might be having is, man, I, I don't have trauma. I didn't deal with it. I'm good. Life was good. Some of you guys might be thinking, I mean, I had some stuff go down, but I'm over it. It was years ago. I was young. Or some of you guys might be thinking, man, you don't know what I went through. You don't know the load I carried. You don't know what I carried in here today. And you may be right. I may not know what you went through. I may not know what you're going through or what you carry. What I do know is I have a father above who does know. And I have a father above who wants to help you to treat your trauma, to address your trauma. So I'm going to challenge you guys. I'm going to ask you guys to go on this journey with me. It's the same journey that I went through as I was preparing to not go into airplane mode, not to zone out, not to build any walls. Can we go on this journey together, church? Amen. Amen. So God wants you to take you on this journey. But there's a question we have to realize. How do you deal with trauma before it deals with you? You see, because trauma is something dangerous because if we don't address it, if we don't deal with it properly, it's something that it's going to deal with you. It's going to find its way with you. Matter of fact, the enemy is going to use it against you. So how do you deal with trauma before it deals with you? Number one, you have to write this down. No, you never have to do it alone. You never have to do it alone. Now, it says in Scripture evident how we never do things alone. Matter of fact, check out what it says in Galatians 6.2. It says, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. Share each other's burdens. Can I, can I make a picture for you guys real quick? Can you guys imagine what it would look like if we put our pride aside and we were real with our brothers and sisters? Can you imagine what it would look like if we didn't put on a mask, put on a facade when people ask us how we're doing? When people ask us how we're doing, we're almost conditioned to say, I'm blessed and highly favored. How are you doing? Jesus woke me up today, amen? Let, let me tell you this. You can stay surface level. 
You could keep it shallow. You could keep it surface level. But check this out. Surface level friends is going to bring surface level faith. Matter of fact, surface level friends are going to bring surface level healing. So you could keep telling yourself. You could keep lying to yourself, convincing yourself and those around you that you are good, you're okay. But guess what? Stay surface level. Your faith is going to be capped. Your healing is going to be capped. See, not only does God put people around us, but check out what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 20. Jesus tells his disciples, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. You see, Jesus himself told his disciples that I am with you always. I may be leaving you physically, but I am with you always. I'm in your hearts. Not only that, but he'd go on to tell his disciples that I'm actually leaving you a helper. I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit. Now, you might be thinking, man, I, well, I don't really need to bring it up right now. It happened years ago, or I'm over it. It's not harming anyone. It's not affecting my day-to-day. But let, check out. Look, look what it says in Psalms 44, 21. It says, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. So check this out. To deal with trauma, we need to realize something. Just because it is hidden does not mean it is not deadly. Just because something is hidden does not take away its impact. See, there may be a snake under that rock. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean it can't hurt you. You see, trauma is dangerous because we could keep it hidden. We could hide it within ourselves. We could almost convince ourselves that we lost it. But what the enemy wants you, he wants you to lock that trauma inside. He doesn't want you to heal from it. He doesn't want you to be delivered from it. Matter of fact, he doesn't want you to grow from it. The devil wants that trauma to sit. He wants you to forget about it. He wants it to be bottled up. He wants it to ferment, to rot, so that when he tests you, when he puts a trial in front of you, and best believe he will, it's going to pop. And all those past feelings, all those past emotions, everything you thought you overcame, it's going to come rushing back. You need to stop hiding what hurts you and let it come out. It's time to reveal what you carry. It's not doing you any justice to hide it. Now, once you reveal Once we sit and reveal, like, okay, I got some things bottled up. God has something greater for you. Now, we're we're, going to jump into Luke chapter 8 real quick. But before before we jump into the verse, can I I give you some background real quick? See, in Luke chapter 8, we actually read about a couple parables and a couple miracles that Jesus does. See, this one in particular, it's a really powerful story. It's about how Jesus actually heals a demon-possessed man. You see, when Jesus heals this man, it actually gives a great description of what was going on with this man. This man would not live at a home. He'd live in the tombs. It says that they would shackle him up. They would chain him up, and he'd break free. At night, he would roam around screeching and howling, cutting himself with rocks. This man was jacked up. Scripture shows he was jacked up, but Jesus heals him, and he delivers him. And I really want to key into these last two verses because they're so powerful. So Luke 8, 38 through 39, this is right after Jesus heals him, delivers him. It says, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him earnestly to be with him. But he sent them away and said, this is what Jesus says, last verse, super powerful. Go back to your home and tell all that God has done for you. And off he went, proclaiming throughout town how much Jesus had done for him. So church, you want to know how to deal with trauma before it deals with you? Number three, write this down. You got to turn your trauma into testimony. You have to turn your trauma into testimony. You see, what Jesus did here is that he didn't tell this man, go home, go to your family, go to your day-to-day, go to your job, whatever. No, Jesus says, go into town and tell him what I have done for you. Some of you guys are holding on to burdens that are hurting you, and your last part of freedom is to go tell him what God is doing in your life. To let what God delivered you from to be outspoken to others. See, your story, your trauma, it may not be demonic possession. You might even belittle it. But your healing, your freedom is what can set another person free. You may have come from a toxic family. You may have come from a toxic friendship. You might even be in church hurt. But Jesus, he tells you, you are free. Not only to keep it within you, but tell others. Our life does not have any less value because what we went through. 
the freedom and healing we have as a son and a daughter could be the opportunity for someone as well. Church, it's time we turn our trauma to testimony. It's time that we let our story be the last thing to touch us, that we let it impact others, that it be the last thing to hurt us, the last thing to affect us, and we flip it on the enemy and say, God, I'm using this for you. That's my freedom, that this is you, God. So church, it's time we turn our trauma to testimony. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for letting me share the word of God with you. Come on, give it up for all the sons and daughters today, church. What a, what a powerful day. I mean, from shame to, uh, to bitterness and loneliness and trauma, Man, I just, I thank God for these, these young leaders here for being vulnerable and courageous to talk about real stuff, real stuff that they've been through, real stuff that they've walked out, real stuff for us to deal with even, even today. When you hear these topics be brought up, I mean, shame and, and loneliness and bitterness and, and, and trauma, there's a few responses that we could have. Some of us have walls that have gone up throughout these messages, like, I don't know if I'm ready for all of that, that is a response that may be happening in this room right now. And then there's, a, there's another response that we need to reveal as well. Some of you, your response to, to this stuff being brought up, the shame and, and, and the bitterness and all that, your response is just to, okay, well, well then uh, I'll just do more good. We just come to church more. I'll just come to church more. I'll get, I'll get in that group then. I'll just, I'll do that. I'll do it. I'll outweigh the bad with good, in which I want you to come, I want you to come to church, I want you to get in the group, I want you to get in that stuff, but if you think that you could step on the scales and tip it in a direction where somehow your good would outweigh your bad, you'll never be free because you're just not that good, and neither am I, and that would be the wrong approach, the religious approach that some of us have fallen into a cycle of. Sometimes you feel good. You step onto the scale and you're like, okay, I feel good about myself. I outweigh the bad. But there's other times that we'll step onto that scale and you know your bad is outweighing your good and you feel your worth diminish and your value diminish. And I want you to know that that is not, that's not faith. That's not Christianity. That's not, that's not the solution. The solution is in the name of today's service, sons and daughters. See, God invites you into relationship. Not into religion, but into a relationship. And from that, from that position, as a son of God, and as a daughter of God, there is no scale that you step on. Get, get rid of that. Some of you have, have not even like come to church for this very reason. You haven't come to God, or you don't like religion, you don't like church, you don't like Christianity, all this stuff, because of this picture of the scale, because you know that if you'd step on it, that you're not. You know in here, like, I'm just not. I don't want to be on that, on that scale. And that is a false picture of faith, a false picture of what Jesus offers. There is no scale. It's been demolished by Jesus on the cross. He invites you into a relationship that you would be part of the family of God. And when God sees you as his son and has his daughter, not just for a few, but for every single one of us, he doesn't ask you to step on a scale. He treats you. How do you treat your kids? He doesn't put you on a scale and outweigh the good and the bad. No, you're his son, an heir of the promise of God, a child of God. And it's from that position, listen to me, it's from that place of, of a son and a daughter of God that you now have the power to truly change, not by your efforts, but by him working inside of you from the inside out, changing your mind, changing your heart, changing your desires, not you trying to and have to and got to, but his spirit inside of you just changing your identity. That, my friends, is Christianity. That is faith. And that may be what a lot of you need to do today. Not put up the wall not try to outweigh the scale of, not try to outweigh the balance and do more good. Just surrender. Just come to the family of God through Jesus. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. 
Go love God, love each other, and change the world.